welcome in this new episode of Our Voices. Britain's longest reigning monarch, Queen Elizabeth, passed away recently on Thursday, September 8th. And around the world, some people have been glued to the TV to see the first time in their lives how a real-life queen is honored when she passes away. Ladies, you've seen the reports on TV and how they've followed uh, the processions and the ceremonies. What did you think? It was pretty um, interesting. I mean, the media had a huge part on how captivating the past few days have been, right? Mm -hmm. Almost all media outlets abandoned their usual coverage just to talk about the, the days of the Queen. They dispatched the reporters to London. They um, dedicated the prime time to talk about the Queen and the entire family. And actually, I saw on Daily News mm -hmm. that 33 million people on BBC and other major news outlets were watching live when the days of the Queen was announced. Yeah, lots of ceremonies there. Yeah. As you yeah. know, it's been a very emotional week for me. Mm -hmm. It's been, I was really attached to the Queen. And you've like, lived in, in England. England so. Yes, I did. I went to university in England. Mm -hmm. And it's been like mixed feelings because you want to celebrate her legacy at the same time. I know it's odd to say a 96-year-old woman died, but mm -hmm. it was unexpected. Mm -hmm. But just two days before, she was meeting with this trust, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was quite Nigeria, especially northern Nigeria, we have a very unique type of relationship with the Queen. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of respect and nobility. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's been a very emotional. Yeah. After work, I'm going to go to the British Embassy to sign. And the oh, really? Oh, really? That's anybody can do that. Yes, anybody can do that, my sister and I. Well, it's good to know. Yeah. Well, while many Africans have mourned the death of Queen Elizabeth II, others have not. Her death has brought to the surface many ugly aspects of British colonialism and ignited contentious feelings about her life and legacy. In this new episode, we will hear uh, diverse voices on Queen Elizabeth's long-lasting and controversial relationship with Africa. And what about African queens, historical figures, the women presidents, and other icons who have left a mark on the continent's history? Do we remember them? <clears throat> How do we remember them? In this week's episode of Our Voices, we remember some of Africa's most prominent women who have changed the course of history. As Africa reflects on the legacy of Britain's Queen Elizabeth II, Kenyans remember how a princess visiting the country in 1952 left a queen. Analysts note how Elizabeth helped steer the end of Britain's empire and explosive colonial rule. But while relations were repaired and improved under the monarch, colonialism left lasting wounds. As Juma Majinga reports from VOS Africa News Center in Nairobi, Kenya. She became a queen while on a visit to Kenya and went on to be the last colonial monarch for Africa. Her accession to the throne came as African colonies clamored for independence. Queen Elizabeth II had to supervise the elimination of the British colonial empire. She was able to adjust to the reality of the imperial decline and then transform that imperial decline as if to a good thing, something common that people can uh, be part of and wanted to be part of. That is the Commonwealth. To some Africans, the British colonial rule is synonymous with exploitation. They blame the Queen, the representative of the British interests, for the atrocities during that period. I personally will not forget that I was incarcerated for seven years. I cannot forget I was put together with my father. I cannot forget I left my children for seven years without food, without education. That I will never forget. But with territorial colonialism now decades gone, Memories of the wrongs of British rule in Africa are fading. She was um, many things to many people, to the colonial subjects. At the time of colonialism, she was symbol of the evil that was colonialism. With independence, she was able to transform herself to a likable person. And as a person, she was likable. Queen Elizabeth was widely admired and seen as a role model by many on the continent. The legacy she's left will really uh, keep her name deeply rooted in the heart of generations to come. For me, it's just sad. I can't really say I take it personally, but I mean, it's sad for people around the world and especially for 
England. I've never known any other ruler last that long. So for this now to have happened, well, it only means that every man has an end. Analysts say Queen Elizabeth's biggest legacy is the creation of the Commonwealth. And with the death of the Queen, the future of that legacy now lies with the new King, King Charles III. Juma, Majanga, for VOA News, Nairobi. Thank you so much, Duma Majanga, for that report. Now we look oh, at the role of queenship in the, in the West and the role of African women icon have played through our history. Here on Our Voices, we have African women whose story and legacy have inspired us in various ways, some of whom led men and their societies to freedom that they enjoy today. Now, ladies, yes, we have um, queens in the West that we look at and we see how powerful they've reigned, but we also have queens on the continent and um, wanted to hear what some of the queens that inspires you. Mm -hmm. I want to reflect on Queen uh, Taitu Betol. She's the wife of Emperor Minilik II who ruled from 1889 to 1913. Mm -hmm. I can say uh, Queen Taitu um, had a great contribution to why Ethiopia is never colonized because she was an instrumental in defeating Italians who came to colonize Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. She led over 5,000 uh, infantry and won a battle herself. She's also, um, she also founded uh, the capital city uh, and gave it the name Addis Ababa, which we use it today. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. so I can say Queen um, uh, Taitu mm -hmm. was just not a wife of a king. She mm -hmm. made sure that she also had a role in political decision making, mm -hmm. in uh, diplomacy, in military campaigns at a time when women had zero place. So wow. we see her as a hero. Many Ethiopians see her as a hero today. Wow. Impressive. Power in the shadows. Indeed. Yeah. Oh, no, we have only one queen, Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> 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 well, in the West, it's interesting. Which queen maybe in Nigeria or in the West? That That's what I'm saying. In queen Nigeria, Elizabeth. Is only have queen Elizabeth. There's oh. only one Saraudia. Is that maybe why <laughs> you, you know, feel deeply about the queen? Well, uh, definitely. We do have a special kind of relationship with the crown. Um, okay. In the 1800s, when, when Lagos was annexed, mm -hmm. um, there was a stray princess whom Queen Victoria gave refuge to. Okay. But enough about <laughs> the British okay. monarchy. Okay. Well, in northern Nigeria, we don't really have queens per se. Okay. Um, we have the myth of Queen Amina of Zaria, mm -hmm. but she, if, if she did exist, she would have existed pre-Islam, uh -huh. before Islam came to that region. Mm -hmm. And we don't really take a lot of pride in any of our culture pre-Islam. Okay. We tend to keep our heritage at Islam and then on. Okay. But from among princesses, one mm -hmm. that comes to mind is Asma Udofodio. She is definitely someone whom I admire a lot. Mm -hmm. She was the daughter of um, Sheh um, Usman Sheh Udofodio, who established the Sokota Caliphate in northern Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, um, she was an intellectual. She contributed a lot to Islamic literature, literature that we have in Nigeria today. Okay. So she's one person that I definitely admire. That is interesting to hear that in, in Nigeria, there isn't really a queen that the country Not has. Really, it's really rare now. We have strong first ladies. Oh, strong first ladies. Strong, yes, we have yes, strong first ladies strong first like ladies. Mariam Babangida. Right. She is I Mabangida. reflect on, you know, being from East Africa and Burundi. Um, uh, I go to West Africa. I reflect on uh, Ya Asanto, the queen of the modern day Ghana. Uh, her story is very fascinating how she was the gatekeeper of what was called the golden stool, and the golden stool represented the mm. soul of the nation. Mm -hmm. And when the British wanted to take that golden stool to sit on it as a sign of taking the empire, as a gatekeeper, she said, no way. And uh, it's interesting you said uh, an army of 5,000 that the queen in Ethiopia fought with. Queen um, Ya Santwa also fought a, a battalion uh, with a battalion of 5,000 men. And yeah. so it's interesting how her interest was more to keep the soul of the nation intact. Uh, this particular ancestral tool was never going to be given up because it represented giving up the people's um, identity. And so I reflect on her. And, and having such a strong woman character at that time mm -hmm. um, is very admirable, don't you think so? And, and for them to give, to make her the gatekeeper of such an important aspect of uh, you know, the soul of the nation, I think also speaks to the people in the nation. So let's hear what other people had to say about the passing of Queen Elizabeth II. Here are some reactions from Malawi and Britain. Queen to me, she was the queen. First of all, we have like a history because her reign started in Kenya 
like when when she she became queen and I'm originally from Kenya so that has got some sort of like um, tie if you like and what I think about her reign is 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 it's been wonderful because all these years she's been there she's been strong she's a mother she's a grandmother she's led you know well, her pledge like to um, what is it called like be there for the country all her years and she's there is always mixed feelings about this you know there are people who still hold dearly on to what has happened but like I said I think we all have different views and for me even though that is still very strong but we have to move on as you know with with present times the passing of anyone I do think is sad thing if anyone passes away is not something that will take joy in it and I do understand people grieving for something that's kind of been stable in their life for so long but I do think that there's a lot of issues that have come with that and now that it is the Queen and kind of the figurehead of our state almost that is passing we're now seeing so many things come to light that are problematic obviously the history is very flawed to put it nicely um, but I think that for me personally anyway and from the conversations I've had with people whether that be friends, family or people in work this is something that maybe should it continue? I feel like there's a lot of, um, how to say, like, neither here nor there. There's so many different opinions. Um, and yeah, some people won't speak out because of how um, England's treating people who do speak out against the monarchy. Um, and yeah, are just afraid. And then there's some people who love the monarchy, but Yes, not here or there, I think. When I heard about the Queen's death, I was saddened. I was um, uh, uh, sad because, um, in as much as I don't know how what she did in other countries, but for Malawi, she built a hospital, Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital, which is one of the best referral hospitals in Malawi. And uh, when I follow her history, it seems like um, she also took part in, uh, in uh, lobbying for other things that we are seeing today. Personally, I honestly am really not as affected by her passing. I mean, I feel sorry for the family, for the royal family, but I think they've got enough riches to make themselves feel better. I mean, it's nice to pat yourself at the back with some gold <laughs> that I think they have. So, I mean, honestly, my life is the same. It's going on the same. Nothing has changed. I mean, the same way the UK don't really care when we lose a leader. We lost a, a very good president, Bingham Tariq, a couple of years back. It didn't seem like anybody in the UK was affected by it. So, same here. I felt bad about the death because, uh, you know, she, being a human being, she had a family. Uh, so the family members uh, uh, maybe were not, were, are not feeling good. But even by now, they are not feeling good because they have lost someone they loved. But uh, to talk more about maybe my country, I cannot say much about uh, uh, her achievements. The only thing I know is about uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital. Uh, I don't know much about her. But I've just said that she's dead, and that doesn't concern me. But I heard that she came here in Malawi, and that hospital, Queen's Elizabeth Hospital, it was named after her. It's time for a break. When we return, my co-host and I speak to Joyce, uh, speak uh, to you, and show you some of the women icons of our time. Stay with us. Women are using their voices to empower, to nurture, to educate. Amajguyachu, Dimsachan, Maria Yemu, our voices. As we reflect on the life and passing of Queen Elizabeth II of England, we continue to reflect on African queens and female icons that we have learned about in their life and legacy and what they have accomplished in their, uh, for their people. And then, then and now, we bring into you, uh, into the show today, two women who will help us move the conversation forward a bit. 
one who will speak to us from Dakar, Senegal, Mrs. Kumba Toure, a woman leader of a pan-African movement called Africa Rising for Justice, Peace and Dignity that has unified 800 organizations in Africa and in the diaspora. Another woman we're speaking to today is Professor Obasanja, a former senator in Nigeria and an author of the book African President's Daughter. In her publication, Obasanja will tell us a little bit more about uh, her role um, as a political leader. Uh, welcome, ladies, and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we are glad to have you in. So this conversation is really to look at um, further the influence of African women on the continent. Uh, do you think that, um, let me begin with you, Mrs. Toure, do you think that um, women on the continent are now fighting for uh, a seat at the table for the number uh, to increase, or is it more to make impact in their societies? Um, I guess I have first to just react to what I've heard. Um, I'm sitting here pretty shocked <laughs> at uh, the um, the reactions to the to the Queen's death. I'll have to say first of all that I'm not shocked at her death uh, because I mean she's ninety something years old. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sad either. I'm not a close family, uh, but uh, from the people that I work with, you spoke about eight hundred organizations and network around the continent, uh, what we see is uh, what the Queen and the royal family of England uh, and the government of England and Europe have taken from Africa, uh, whether it's through slavery or colonization, and um, nothing but reparation and real reparation uh, can take that away. And when we say that it's not about talking about the past, it's about talking about the present day of how a majority of African lives in abject poverty and when this continent has been rich uh, forever. So I just had to, 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 to mention that before I say anything, I'm, I'm actually shaken by uh, so many of the things that I heard in this conversation before. Mm -hmm. And it just tells me how much work we have to, to go uh, along. Now about, um, royalty in general, uh, I think uh, we have to come to term uh, with the fact that when we say somebody is a queen or, the, or a king, you mean somebody else is not. And those somebody are most of the time most of the people of the world. There is something inherently unjust in royalty, and whether it's African or, or European actually doesn't matter uh, in, in, in that sense. So um, it's a thing of the past. It should stay there. Of course, we have to lift up and tell the stories of African queens of the past. But today, today we want the young people of Africa, the young women of Africa right. uh, to be part of leadership, not to be a royal, but to, to fight, not only to find a seat at a, at a table, uh, but even yeah. to create new table to invite people in. Uh, today in Senegal, we are facing a strong fight, even at our National Assembly, where many people are saying that Aminata Toure Mimi should be the president of the National Assembly. But because she is a woman, uh, she has been sidelined. My question is to Professor Obasanjo. Um, so Mrs. Traore made mention of um, young women in Africa. So as a former woman leader in politics on the continent and one who grew up in that environment, do you see something that is still a major hindrance for women today in order for more of them to emerge as leaders on the continent? Um, Mrs. First. Chiwe for that and for, for what she said, because I totally agree. Um, I do. I also want to add, before I answer the question, that we do need to honor our queens. We need to honor the queens we had before any other religion came, be it Islam or Christianity. Because um, all religion is ancestral worship. Those are our ancestors and the people that made us be who we are. It wasn't the people that brought things to us. It's almost saying that uh, we as Africans did not exist before something else came to influence us. We've always existed. Our ancestors lived good lives. They made us, without them, we wouldn't be here. So Queen Amina, 
of, of um, Zhao Zhao, Queen Nzinga of Congo, they are all should be cherished because they were humans and they were humanity. And I don't think they were, they were stories. They were not legends. They were human beings that lived and um, so that we could be here. Uh, moving on to what um, what hinders women, or, or, or I, I think there are three things: money, um, time, yeah. and and the other one is violence. Um, African politics tends to be very violent and um, very um, very winner takes all. Um, and at some point, I think most women will shun it because of that. The money one, um, again, is because most women are not in the professions that um, and have the resources to be able to, and policy, politics is expensive. Um, when when we tout democracy, and I'm, I believe that democratic governance is better for everybody, um, better for society, but it's also expensive to participate in, um, even in the in, in um, rich countries, in, in richer countries, um, it, it is not something. And um, in in African countries, we do not have the. Um, culture of donation to campaigns and, and kind of and all that that has been done, but even to donate, you no, know, to even to campaign to start to be recognized as somebody to participate um, takes um, takes money. Mm -hmm. Then there is the time, mm -hmm. the I have, time that we, yes. Yeah, I have another question for Miss Story here on in our voices. We have a segment. Uh, called Women to Watch segment, where we highlight women who are impacting their communities. And I saw that you also have a similar uh, uh, program on your platform, Invisible Gents, where you celebrate uh, uh, women who are achievers. Mm -hmm. So uh, from a ground perspective, can you tell us briefly why this um, should be important? Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, the reality is everything we see today, uh, every changes that we witness, positive changes, things that we benefit from, if we are here sit sitting today as women talking the way we want, it's because some people have done the work and fought and moved things. And most of the time, um, women's names are erased in, in histories. Um, most of the time, it is not their name that is, uh, you know, spelled out. Uh, when we win battles, when things happen. Mm -hmm. So um, for more than 10 years, um, I've been celebrating what I call invisible giants because when we look into the past, we have to dig deep. People have to look deep to even know the stories of uh, Queen Amina or, or the queens and, and so on. So mm -hmm. it is our duty today to celebrate the women of today who are making a difference, to document them, to take their pictures, to write their stories, to record their voices, so that tomorrow uh, our children and great-grandchildren don't have to, to, to look so far and dig so deep and be so incredulous when we start talking about uh, women being leaders. Uh, African women have always uh, been, been leaders, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as far as you can go, yes. uh, all the way to ancient Egypt. Mm. Yes, we definitely want to go deeper into this conversation. But first, let's take a quick break. And to our viewers, please share your thoughts on our social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, our number is on your screen. We'll be right back. Empowerment and humanity towards a better world. Facts and information from key players rather than spectators in politics, business, science and technology. City, rural, educated, all underprivileged. We care and we listen to what matters to you. Your, Your voices, voices are our voices. voices. Well, let's continue the discussion with our guests, with Professor Obasanje and Mrs. Toure. Uh, ladies, uh, as we try to wrap up the show, um, more questions for our guests, for sure. 
Yeah, definitely. But before we go to that, mm -hmm. I think they were stressing on the fact that how um, there is a mixed feeling about the days of the Queen, right? Mm -hmm. uh, of, about the monarchy in general. Mm -hmm. Some definitely see her as an icon, as a great leader, but others see her as, as, as an exploitation of uh, Africa. They see that they cannot separate the institution from the person. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I say let every soul bear its own burden. <laughs> I say we judge Queen Elizabeth as an individual, what she did as an individual. Mm -hmm. Queen Elizabeth was someone who seldom had any political opinions, mm -hmm. but she definitely did stand um, against apartheid. Mm. Well, we uh, continue with our guest uh, uh, in the studio uh, on online, especially uh, Mrs. Ture in uh, Africa. Uh, the giants, the, the, the in invisible giants that you talk about in your association, what are some of the messages that you give them to empower them to go into leadership position, as you've mentioned? Um, really, it is not uh, to me to give them those messages. I found them there, um, these, these women have the leadership. Uh, if we look closely, uh, if we need to find women who can uh, be leaders, uh, you just need to look and you'll find them across this continent. Um, and to me, uh, the Queen of England doesn't have more leadership than any other African women. Um, the only thing that she has is that she's born into a family uh, of royalty and a system of injustice that decided through a group of people can inherit and even if it's stolen good, she can wear it as a crown and it still look good even if it's theft. So uh, really, uh, my, my work is to make visible uh, what is already there, what is invisibilized mainly by, by a system of you know, economic systems, social systems and value system that don't look at African yes. women. Yeah, uh -huh. unfortunately, time is not on our side. We're going to have to end it there. But we really appreciate your time to join us and to pitch in into this conversation uh, that is so important for women on the continent of Africa. This is where we're going to end our show today. Thank you for our guests, uh, Professor Obesanjo and also Mrs. Ture there in Dakar, uh, and also for my co-host, uh, Amina and uh, Semingesh. For VOA Our Voices, I'm Oriani Tangishakar. Thank you for watching. Good day. Women are using their voices to empower, to nurture, to educate. Amajgu Yachu, Dimsachan, Mario Yemu, our voices. <laughs>